This is a tale of treachery, betrayal, but it's also a tale of camaraderie and overcoming all odds to do the unthinkable. When a man scorned sets out for revenge against the guilds that rejected him, he unwittingly forges an alliance between bitter rivals who put aside their differences to attempt something that nobody had ever done before. Kill the unkillable dragon, much to the dismay of the developers who designed it. Welcome back to Many Scandals. Before we get started, have you ever wanted to be a YouTuber? What about being an animator? Or how about just learning to cook better? All of this and more could be yours, thanks to today's sponsor, Skillshare. All right, I'm gonna let you in on a little secret. Uh, I only actually learned how to edit a month before I posted my first video. And with Skillshare hosting classes on everything from photography to animation to stitching Woodland Creatures 101, exploring texture and hand embroidery, who knows where you could be in a month? I'm constantly trying to improve my editing abilities and Sean Dyking's class on creating visually appealing edits has been super helpful. Turns out I was clicking the big edit button wrong this whole time. The first thousand of you slippery wee buggers who sign up using my link in the description will get a one month free trial of Skillshare so you can start exploring your creativity today. I love seeing you guys get creative so if you learn to make something cool be sure to send it to me and thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video. Our story takes place in the lands of Norath, the theoretically fictional world of EverQuest. Years before World of Warcraft would explode onto the scene and go on to be, well, World of Warcraft, EverQuest set the scene as the first 3D MMORPG to find mainstream success, climbing to an impressive 100,000 concurrent players in 2001, a feat that today would see it in Steam's top 10 most played games. A dangerous, unforgiving online fantasy world that set players against the forces of darkness and dial-up internet. Its brutal difficulty forced players to collaborate and overcome content together, and nothing exemplifies this struggle quite like the fight against Kerafim, the Sleeper. Added in the scars of Velios expansion, the Sleeper's Tomb was a high-end raid zone that saw EverQuest players face off against the four Dragon Wardens keeping the prismatic dragon Kerafim in an eternal slumber. Unlike modern MMO titles, the Sleeper's Tomb wasn't an instanced area where each group of players had their own private copy of the dungeon and instead took place in the main overworld shared with everyone else. Each of the four Dragon Wardens dropped some powerful unique gear, and if at least one Warden was kept alive, the others would eventually respawn, allowing another group of players to wedgie the Wardens for a new wristwatch. However, if all four Wardens were killed at once, the three hour video game essay playlist keeping the sleeper in his magical slumber would be paused, and when Kerafim awoke, players quickly found out why he was entombed. You see, Kerafim's whole encounter was part of EverQuest's ongoing story, and once awoken, he would go on a rampage, swinging his morning wood throughout the tomb and across the countryside, leaving a trail of death and destruction, and at least one player who came back from a piss to discover his characters dead. Once Kerafim reached their destination, another dungeon in the zone, they would slaughter the bosses there as part of the game's story, before evaporating from the game forever. Kerafim wasn't the only dragon to nip out for a pack of smokes and never come back, as the four dragon wardens who served as his jailers would never spawn again, taking their unique rare items with them. Kerafim's awakening would happen once per server, and while the first few servers were caught completely off guard, the remaining servers began to hear tales of a legendary dragon whose power was unmatched by anything else in the game. I really can't stress just how powerful he was. This wasn't a case of finding a group of the sweatiest players decked out in the best gear to give him a run for his money. You could be wearing the most powerful armor in the game and still be killed in a single swipe of his claws or the instant kill spell he would cast with seemingly unlimited range, in addition to a complete immunity to magic, meaning only melee and ranged players could even put a scratch on him. To top it all off, he had more health than any other creature in the game. While the exact number is unknown, the most damage he reportedly received on any server was a whopping 1% of his health. Players assumed that a creature this legendary must drop some equally legendary loot, but 
Sony Online Entertainment, the company behind EverQuest, really didn't want Kerafim to be killed, as it was important for the game's ongoing story that he lived. Of course, gamers have always been a stubborn bunch, and if you dangle a seemingly impossible task in front of them that doesn't involve leaving the house, they will dedicate dozens, hundreds, or even thousands of hours towards this challenge. And as Kerafim's infamy grew, so too did the number of players looking to slay him. Server after server saw valiant knights charge into battle against the sleeper, glory in their eyes and their chests swelling with pride at the thought of being the first to kill the unkillable, moments before being mutilated faster than a Chinese steelworker on Lively. This seemingly impossible task seemed more and more impossible by the day, and eventually, Kerafim was awoken and undefeated on all but one server. Ralos Zek. Ralos Zek was a lawless server, a chaotic realm where players were free to kill one another and steal the loot from the bodies of their freshly slaughtered victims. It's in a realm such as this where greed would win over glory, as once the four dragon wardens were killed and the sleeper is awoken, players would no longer be able to access the unique loot that the wardens dropped. Because players were free to kill one another, any guild that looked like it was attempting to wake the sleeper was quickly dealt with, which kept any would-be glory seekers in check. After fighting themselves in a Mexican standoff, these powerful guilds made a pact to ensure that nobody would wake the sleeper. But of course, it only takes one person to pull the trigger for all hell to break loose. Stinkfist was a lizard man monk, and to say he had a chip on his shoulder would be an understatement. He was practically wearing a pair of Yukon Golds as pauldrons. For reasons lost to time, he found himself cast out from Ascending Dawn, one of Ralos Zek's most powerful guilds. Scorned and powerless, he slinked into the shadows, plotting his revenge. Over time, Stinkfist teamed up with a ragtag team of players who shared his vision, aptly named The Curse. But even with his newfound cohorts, he had nowhere near the power needed to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Ascending Dawn or any of the other big dogs on the server. But he wouldn't need to engage them in open combat. He would only need to hit them where it hurts. Their loot. Utilizing knowledge from his time in Ascending Dawn, Stinkfist not only knew about the pact to not wake the sleeper, he knew exactly when the guilds were most active, and conversely, when they weren't. Planning a daring nighttime raid on the sleeper's tomb, the revenge he sought was almost in his grasp. But unsurprisingly, a guild of sketchy players wasn't exactly watertight, and Stinkfist's intentions to wake the sleeper were linked to the big guilds who had formed the Kerafim Truce. They decided if anyone was going to wake the sleeper, it must be them. And not only would they wake him, they were going to do something that nobody had ever done before. They were going to kill him. On a sunny day in November 2003, three guilds began their assault on the sleeper's tomb. Ascending Dawn, Wudan, and Magus Imperialis Magicus, which is apparently Latin for I don't know, I don't speak Latin. The four wardens quickly fell at their combined effort, awakening Kerafim for the last time in EverQuest history. Now, normally for a fight like this, you'd have a big beefy tank character absorbing all of the pain, damage dealers on the side stabbing the dragon in the shins, and healing characters giving blue Gatorade to anyone who got hurt. But of course, this clearly didn't work for any of the other servers, so instead, these guilds implemented a much stupider method. Kamikaze anyone who could hold a sharp stick at Kerafim, doing as much damage as they can before their inevitable death, and then have the healing characters on the sidelines ready to resurrect their fallen brethren, who would quickly pull their pants back on before running in for another bitch slap. Like subscribing to my channel and tickling the like button, everyone was shocked at just how effective the strategy was. Slowly but surely, Kerafim's health ticked down, overtaking the previous record of 99%, then 98%, 90%, 80%. Three hours and at least a thousand deaths later, the players held strong, 40%, 30%. Suddenly, at 26%, Kerafim simply disappeared. 
was this a glitch? Maybe the script that made Kira from Go on his rampage had, you know, some kind of despawn timer on it. I mean, he was never designed to be killed, right? Well, it turns out that Ralos Zex guilds weren't the only ones surprised by the effectiveness of this tactic. And one of the EverQuest moderators watching the fight despawned Kerafim before he could truly be defeated. The devil shivers when a gamer rages. And he had no shortage of enraged gamers to quiver over today. Hours of fighting and at least a thousand deaths with nothing to show. All because the players had essentially outsmarted the developers. The whole situation reeked of the kid at school who threw a hissy fit when you beat him at his own game. Or the dungeon master who punishes you for thinking outside the box and not playing the game exactly as they intended. Some people felt that this betrayed the very nature of the game itself. A game is by definition a series of rules that players must operate within in order to overcome obstacles. And if the people running the game are willing to break these rules and pull a deus ex machina because it isn't going their way, I mean, why should any of the people playing it follow them either? Speculation around SOE's motives ran rampant, made all the more obtuse by the revelation that it was a decision made from one of the higher ups in the company, and the game master who enacted it was simply following orders. In a statement put out by SOE, they claim that there may have been a bug where Kirifim was focusing on a different NPC in the zone instead of the player characters, presumably allowing them to get in some free hits while the sleeper stared off into space. As this would have been considered exploiting a bug, the sleeper was despawned as per their terms of service. But even still, the statement also noted that, having investigated the bug further, they were unclear if this was a real issue or not. Other theories at the time believed that SOE was afraid of what might happen if Kerafin was killed. After all, he was programmed to go on a rampage and despawn at a specific time. Maybe if you killed him before he could do any of that, the servers might crash. With Kerafin taken from them, players began to treat SOE as their new raid boss, chipping away at them until, unlike Kerafin, they caved and decided to respawn the sleeper, allowing the guilds of Ralos Zek to have one last crack at him. On November 17th, 2003, over 200 players reconvened on the sleeper's tomb. By this point, word had spread throughout the community of the rival guilds who put aside their differences to come together and do the unthinkable. Except the guilds of Ralasek knew that it was in fact very much able to be thonked. With EverQuest's 2003 server technology beginning to splinter at the sheer number of players fighting in one area, our valiant heroes began the long and arduous fight against Kerafin. Described as both intense and boring at the same time, the knowledge that you are participating in a world first kill with all eyes on you didn't detract from the fact that the janky strategy they had developed was exceptionally tedious. Altogether, the 200 plus players averaged around 271 damage per second, while Kirifim was knocking out an exceptional 1400, which is almost 500 times as much if you do the maths wrong. Still, the battle raged on, with Kirifim's health dropping to 50%, then 26%. Only this time, he didn't despawn. 10%, 5%. And finally, after almost four hours of dying, resurrecting, running, stabbing, and dying again, a wizard by the name of Trilin from the Wudan Guild landed the killing blow. 30 seconds later, and Kirifim's corpse vanished from the world, which was the case for all corpses that had no loot on them. Yes, unsurprisingly, the devs never bothered to put loot on a creature that was never meant to be killed. Still, as a gesture of goodwill, Game Masters took the time to go around gifting rare items to the players who participated, and even put out a server-wide message that announced the triumph of Ralos Zek to the world. Of course, the real reward was never the loot. It was leaving their mark on a game that they cherished. A list of heroes whose names are now forever carved into the history of EverQuest. If you think what the EverQuest developers did was bad, Wait until you see my video on RuneScape's most hated developer. Thanks again to Skillshare for sponsoring this video.